Welcome to Seeking Out the Next Generation, or SO for short. This is a podcast dedicated to finding young people from all walks of life with interesting experiences and stories to share. Our focus is not on those already in the social media spotlight. Instead, we are seeking out everyday people who we can relate to and whose stories have the potential to inspire us, regardless of what we're doing in our own lives. So, let's get started. Hi there, I'm your host, David Mar Roberts. For this week's episode of Seeking Out, we've decided to try something a bit different. So far, we've been sharing stories from everyday people on themes like coping with grief, youth politics, and we've touched on women's health and mental health issues. But so far, we haven't really delved too much into the world of business startups. I've always been fascinated by entrepreneurs and innovators. And so if you're interested in what kind of person becomes a startup CEO and what kind of stories they have to tell, then we have a whole series of interviews coming up for you. This week's episode features our first startup CEO, whom I met in the Seeking Out studios in Bath. Uh, my name is Paul Hetherington. I'm the CEO and co-founder of NeuroAI based here in Bath. Uh, we basically make computers for artificial intelligence, probably the best way to explain it. Um, I started the company with a buddy of mine uh, when we were just in our final year of university. So I'm 22 now, about to turn 23 actually this month. So uh, welcome to Seeking Out. Our mission is to um, find interesting and inspiring people who have stories that um, they're prepared to share with others. Um, and this episode is all about entrepreneurs. So, you know, we really are interested in who they are, what makes them tick, who and what inspires them really, you know, and, and if there are lessons that we can pass on to people who listen to this. Um, so to, to set the scene, go into a bit more detail about your business as a sort of context so you know what is it that you do in maybe a little bit more detail even though I get I appreciate that AI is not everybody's understanding but kind of what problems do you solve? We're a hardware based company and we design processes that are really specific at processing artificial intelligence as AI in general is quite a new field computers haven't really caught up to it yet Um, and all of the software developers are basically jumping on uh, old computing systems that have existed for a long time now, specifically graphics cards uh, made for you know playing games, Call of Duty, and you know all stuff like that. So it turns out those GPUs, graphics cards, are really good with AI, but they're not specifically designed to actually process it. So if you chuck out a bunch of stuff from them, change it a little bit, then you can make it really fast at running AI, and that's what we do pretty much. So I'm the main processor uh, designer at the moment. Uh, we created our own programming language to actually run with it. Uh, which was really, really cool. Um, that was very difficult to design, as you can imagine. Um, and yeah, we've created basically a, a standalone computer uh, is the best way to think about it, but it doesn't operate as one. How do you come about with the, the idea or, or the need for this? So did, is this something that happened at university or um, before? What, how, did, how, did, how did it all come about? Yeah, um, so throughout my studies, I was doing a four-year course, um, like an integrated master's program up at the University of Bath. Uh, to kind of fund some of my stuff throughout university, I was also a researcher while I was there. I worked on several research projects as like an RA sort of thing, a research assistant. So the last project I was on was in something called ultrasound tomography. Uh, which is basically the ultrasound version of a CT scan. Okay. Yeah. So I made lab equipment to basically take images through ultrasound. Uh, the scope of that project was actually we we wanted long term to take training data from like MRI machines and then detect anomalies through AI basically, so tumors, hemorrhages, that sort of thing. Um, so what I did was I made this equipment and then used AI to recorrect the images, remove noise, and then produce much clearer images. Uh, for what you really actually want to see. Trying to work with AI then, a lot of the problems in the industry became incredibly apparent to me. Uh, and then I set out to solve it because I could see it was going to be a huge industry. I like designing hardware-based things. And yeah. One of the interesting things here is obviously because we're not a tech show as such, even though I, I do come from that world um, a little bit, but we're kind of interested about the human, the, you know, the, the founder, the entrepreneur, um, and get a sense of, whilst you're working out the, the solutions to these problems you've identified you know what are the i guess the key highs and the key lows you might have 
encountered so far. I'm sure there's more to come in both directions, but and I get a sense of how you how you've reacted or how you've learned from that as an individual. That would be really interesting. Yeah, well, I've had quite a peculiar startup experience in general. I was a part of another company uh, kind of partway through my studies, actually. Um, and that was my first exposure to the startup community as a whole. And then towards the end of university, obviously, then this whole company came about. Um, and I think that f for me, the best part of it all is kind of the freedom you get. <laughs> like my, my goal when, you know, everything started was not to have a successful company as such. It was to have firstly a product that I'm very proud of um, and to work in an environment where we're all proud of that thing that we've made. And then I think if like the product is the focus and that environment is the focus and you do it well, I think money and success will kind of come from it, but it's not the goal. Like the, the, the goal is to create something brilliant. And then if you do that right, then money's a byproduct. But if money's the goal, then it changes the entire dynamic of the company, it changes who you hire, who you fire, what you talk about in meetings all of the time. So I think kind of the, the real high point for everything so far is the fact that I do get that sense that I am tremendously proud of what we work on. And I know that everyone else in the company feels the same. So I think that's, yeah, you can't really ask for a lot more, to be honest. Um, I think it's, it's difficult fundraising. Um, we've had a very good run of it so far, thankfully. So that was brilliant. Like we closed the first funding round before we graduated and we did it in three weeks, um, which is like amazing. You know, we cleared a full SEIS round in the UK. So that's just like 150,000. Um, thankfully, we've had a good run of things so far. So there have not been tremendous low points. I think there's always a lot of soul searching you have to do with a lot of this. Uh, oh, is what we're doing correct? Do people actually need it? Because you have to be very opinionated in meetings about these things. And then obviously you need to present yourself as sure, but behind the scenes, you need to actually genuinely think and be honest, forget ego and everything like that. So that's definitely a challenge. And because I'm 22, so is the other co-founder, everyone we're talking to is significantly older than us. And that's been a challenge up to a certain point. Uh, the dynamic of people in the US to the UK and Europe in general is actually very different. So the US, they love the fact that we're young because it's, you know, they've got a long list of examples where that's really worked out pretty well for them. Facebook, you know, great example. Um, but in the UK and Europe as a whole, they're a lot more risk averse. So they don't like a lack of experience. They don't tend to see it as a positive thing. But now because of what we've done, that's starting to change which is really nice where people, you know, if we say something, they do listen and they do take it seriously. But there's definitely been a long journey to get there. What sounds interesting is obviously you've had to do the whole being assured up front with what you're doing and confident and then the soul searching, the questioning in the background. I'm interested about, again, you as a, as a person is how, how you've come about to develop the, that skill set. Is it just are you a natural at it? Is this something you've always done or you learnt it during uni or has literally just learnt it recently whilst you've been developing this company? Yeah, I, I think it's just played on some other characteristics that I probably had, you know, from upbringing and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I could put it on anything personal of what I've done, to be honest. I think, you know, obviously, you know, people make choices about, you know, what to do when they wake up in the morning, but certainly many experiences I had Kind of growing up has definitely shaped that like i went to you know like a very low performing state school so i got flagged up on all of the universities as like a low income school and that sort of thing so that like come being brought up in that environment with certain people that were around then you like if you want to do anything you do have to think for yourself uh because there was like a point near the end of secondary school where i just didn't go because i was like well the teachers a lot of the time like there were a bunch of times where the teachers just didn't turn up for a class and that sort of thing. So this was in A-levels. And the school basically just said, they were like, cool, you're performing well, so just do what you want. And then I just ended up not going in for a bunch of classes, just studied at home and then got results I'm proud of. Um, and I think the mentality to do that is you just have to actually think for yourself. And I think, again, that's a result of the circumstances I was in. And I think it's unfortunate that I've met a lot of people 
at the university here now who had a very privileged upbringing and those certain skills they themselves say they wish they had because they were helped a lot. They didn't necessarily have to think about things by themselves. So coming from that background is like a blessing and a curse because it, you have to be inherently more independent. Um, but obviously, you know, it sucks at the time. Seeking Out the Next Generation is supported by Storm, an agency that builds world-class digital products and services for startups, scale-ups, and corporate innovators. Find out more at stormconsultancy.co.uk or on Twitter at Storm UK. I have um, a couple of other questions which are probably a little bit more superficial, <laughs> maybe, or maybe not. Um, but do you have any, any habits um, that help you um in your life as an entrepreneur that you you know not necessarily you know there's, a, there's some people i remember one of my best friends would be like uh he'd go to bed at nine wake up at four meditate yeah. you know, there's all yeah. that stuff but but generally are you you know you obviously talked about um questioning yourself in the background but are there, is there a routine or habits or things that that, you, that help you be successful yeah that you can share with yeah yeah um there's a few random things that like in my personal life i've done to kind of uh make things better um i think in terms of like in intra-company stuff though myself and the other founder one night a week we meet up and we do something together and we just talk about how we feel in general um but not from like a super emotional perspective although sometimes we do get personal but it's just we like we spend a lot of time together and we're both emotionally and you know, time ways invested a lot in what we're doing. And we need to be as transparent with everything as possible. And that's been a tremendous help. Like if we've just been getting annoyed at each other, we go and talk about it because it's just gonna get worse otherwise. And then we figure out, okay, like we're both getting annoyed. What's the way that we can change that on a day-to-day -day basis? How can we resolve that? And we've, you know, then we change, okay, so you work on this, I'm gonna work on that, you do that, blah, blah, blah. And then stuff just gets so much better from that. And that's been tremendously helpful. Um, in my personal life, I force myself to take breaks now. So there are weeks where I'm working. I wake up almost every day at 6.30. I will often get back from the office at like 7, 8, 9 at night. Uh, many times I've been working gone past midnight. So the hours I'm racking up are ridiculous um, of how much I'm working. So I force myself at least on Sunday to not do anything company related at all. Um, like I built a desk recently for my flat and that kind of thing. Um, and that was incredibly helpful because you need to just get away from it. Um, I put out a stupid tweet recently about it, but I said uh, tunnel vision is like one of the most annoying things to get rid of because if you need to urgently solve a problem, you wanna work on it. But sometimes you need to step away from it so that you can kind of see the bigger picture and actually see what isn't stupid because you can easily like bounce off a few of you you just get this echo chamber and you can't get out of it so there are a bunch of times where i've been really worked up about something i'll take a break for a day or two and then come back and it was like that was, what the hell was i on about you know um so that's really really useful i got um there's we talk about this a lot in the office but i got some fish recently for my my flat because I said I need a reason to force myself to go home and yeah. look after something and I was like I can't let them die because then I look pretty bad for doing that <laughs> so yeah. so now I have to go home and I have to feed them and I have to look after them you guys seem to have achieved quite a lot but are there any anecdotes that you kind of dine out on in terms of um that you've learned as not learned but you've experienced as an entrepreneur whether it's um, I certainly, when I was fundraising, I met some very strange yeah. potential investors or, oh, yeah. um, you know, ended up in a Learjet with a very wealthy person because that was the only time they had to talk to me. You know, there's some weird yeah. stuff like that. I don't know if you have a few anecdotes that you're, again, happy to share because yeah. this is something yeah. you might not um, want to share. Okay. We, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> we had some very interesting experiences for sure. We spent, a, you know, a bit of time out now in Silicon Valley out there. Uh, like we just rented out like an Airbnb for a few weeks. We've done that a couple of times now. Uh, and we met like our first billionaire over there. We got invited to like this big event at Levi's Stadium where they rented out the entire stadium and had like all of their logos going around the side and stuff like that it was really cool. 
Uh, then we went to like one of the most exclusive country clubs out there, and yeah, in like Menlo Park, which is next to Sequoia and everything else. So that was crazy. Um, we've met some very interesting people. I think being exposed to kind of the one percent of the one percent, the one percent of the world is eye opening. <laughs> uh, the way that people live their lives um, is yeah, it's just crazy to see how different things are from what you're used to. Yeah, I think that's probably the interesting experiences I can say. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I know there's probably those you can't yeah. share, but that that's cool. That's right. We we met. Oh, okay, I will say this. Um, we didn't do this, but microdosing with investors is a very big thing out there, okay. and that was something we were just never even heard of. Um, so yeah, like the whole ecosystem is kind of weird with that kind of stuff. It's yeah, very bizarre. We were just not expecting it. At the end of every sort of segment or every interview we do, but we invite everybody we interview to become like an official seeker of the next generation. And that, that has two parts to it really for you to, to be able to become one. And the first is just to um, agree to introduce us to anybody who you might think has a good story to tell or an interesting inspirational story to tell. But the second thing is, um, is to share if you have like a mantra or an inspirational quote or something that you use a bit as a guiding principle, guiding light. I would say generally the way that I live my life and the way that I've approached problems is I, I don't, I wouldn't say I have a particularly short term for it, um, but I believe almost anyone can do almost or solve almost any problem. And the only variable in it is usually time. So I think the stuff we set out to do was incredibly ambitious and we didn't know how to solve almost all of the problems that we have now, but I trusted that myself and my other founder could figure out what those problems were gonna be and figure out how to solve them. Um, because it really with almost everything we've done, you can just break it down into smaller problems and then they're very easy to solve. I, I've said this to a good number of people now, I think, but I just don't particularly think that the majority of people are actually that limited. Like if you want to do something, I think you probably can. And if that thing is worth doing, then you probably have the responsibility to do it. There are not that many people that I think are actually that incredible to a point where they will never exist again. I, I just think they've worked hard at something for a long time. And I think they would probably say that as well. I do think there are some people obviously that are very unique. I'm not saying that they're not, but I'm saying, you know, don't use that as an excuse not to do something. Like you could do it and that's enough to give it a shot. Well, that was Paul Hetherington, the CEO of NeuroAI. Keep an eye out for him and his company. I am absolutely convinced that they are going to be massively successful in the not too distant future. A big thank you to Paul for his time. And I just wanted to let you know that we have a few more startup CEO interviews lined up over the coming weeks, including ones with Georgia Stewart and Dana Latouf. And I hope you can join me when those come out. See you soon. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Seeking Out. If you would like to nominate someone who you think would have a great story to share in a future episode, please get in touch with us via Instagram, Twitter, or on our website, seekingout.fm. We have many more stories to tell, so please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Google Play or anywhere else you get your podcasts from. And if you like what you hear, it would be great if you gave us a five-star rating. It really helps with people finding us. Seeking Out is supported by Dialect, the content and media agency that specializes in the art and science of audience engagement.